Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. It's interesting that Chris mentioned the axe because I've read online this morning, I don't know where I read it, but it said that um, someone had said that if they had eight hours to drop, um, eight hours to chop down a giant tree, that they would spend the si first six sharpening the axe, which you think, of course you would. But then how, how often in life do we not do that? When we're faced with something that we're trying to sort out in our life, we stress about it, we worry about it, we talk about it. We strive so much, and yet that time spent thinking it through and understanding and getting a sharp approach to it, we'd actually master some stuff a lot quicker, wouldn't we? Um, I wanted to talk tonight, is my title, oh no, that's just me, that's quite freaky when you turn around and you're just there. My title tonight is Jesus, Brand or Revolution. I quite liked my title, so I'll just sit down and leave you to wonder what it was about. Um, Last week, at the very start, I referenced um, going to a museum. When I met my sister in Amsterdam, we went to the Rijk Museum. It was fascinating. And um, I, I've been thinking about it and not been able to let go of this, this understanding that I've gleaned from the world of art. And I just want to share it with you. I am not an expert. Yet again, I find myself up here talking about something I don't know a lot about. But I think that probably means that, like me, some of you may not understand. Is anyone massively, is Claire listening or is she in crash? Anyone else massively into art? Right. If I get anything wrong, I'm really sorry. Um, but I do think there's some real insight to be gained from considering some things today. Now, I'm just going to start by showing you a few um, images, a, a number of which I saw in this museum, others from other places. Okay. So I'm going to start by showing you, this is Rembrandt's Night watch, if you click the slide for me. Now, you can't see it very clearly, but when we saw this in the museum, I mean, it was huge. And the precision and the detail that was explained was absolutely incredible. And at one point, it had been damaged and they had to mend it. And I mean, it took him, I mean, it was just amazing. Now, this was another one we saw, which was Van Gogh's self portrait. Now, you can see the style of art has changed here. Instead of it looking almost like an exact replica, there's something else going on. Look at the next one. This is a different style again, isn't it? So they're all in the gallery, but they're all quite different expressions. Now look at the last one, and this is where I begin to have problems. <laughs> I, I get that it's in the gallery, but that to me is not the same quality of art as some of the others, okay? Now let's go on to the next one. This is also a work of art. I get, just, just see, this is all art, but can you tell how our reactions to some of these expressions? I mean, you might, you might prefer that one. I mean, to be honest, I'd probably rather have that on the wall in Daniel's room, <laughs> not mine, but it, it's not the same, is it? Right, next one. Now, this is, right, this, oh, this makes me laugh. Um, this, one of the things we saw in this gallery, I know it sounds terrible, but I just couldn't take it seriously. We went round this corner, and there was all the Rembrandt bit, and there was all the sculptures, and then we went to the sort of really modern bit, and I had to read the blurb on everything, because I didn't understand what was going on. And there was a man, and he was on a video screen, and it was playing, and he was just crying a crying man, and it was on a loop, and he cried and cried and cried. And it was actually supposed to represent the suffering of Christ. And there was a long explanation about it. Um, but it was a man just on a video crying. And having seen the other things I'd seen in this gallery, I just found myself stood there thinking, I get that this is art, and it belongs here, but it's very different to what I've just been part of somewhere else. Now, look at this one, a couple more to go. This one was when I went to, um, it was on South Bank, I went to London to meet my cousin, and um, we went to, we took the kids to a museum on South Bank, and it was this interactive museum where you had um, every piece of art, you had to make a choice 
about what you were going to do. The funniest one was there were two beds, like hospital beds on wheels, that moved like a millimetre at a time. And one of the things you could choose to do was sleep overnight in the museum. You had to go on a waiting list and lie in the bed all night in the dark and then in the morning see where you ended up and how far you travelled. <laughs> Why not? Now, this was... This was in the middle of the room, and a, a, a pill, like, that looked like a pill, drops from the ceiling every three seconds. Every three seconds. And the choice you had to make was whether you're going to swallow the pill. And there was like a water fountain. And you don't know what's in the pill, and only the artists knew. So it was the difference between who was brave enough to swallow the pill, not knowing what was in it, and who wasn't. Now, you can imagine all of our kids wanted to take this pill, and we were going, no, <laughs> don't eat them, don't eat them. Um, so that's a different form of art. Now, this next piece here is the one I want to pause for a second. <laughs> Has anybody ever come across this genuine work of art? Seriously, does anyone know what it is? It's you, Claire. Claire does. Look, the, art, the artists have heard of it. Now, this is called... Fountain. It is a urinal. This is called Fountain, and it's one of Duchamp's, Duchamp's, whatever, Duchamp's most famous work and is widely known as an icon of 20th century art. It really is. Much debate in the work that foreshadowed this, um, there was much debate in the work that, that I'm reading that out as if I've, that's my notes. Now, this is what it says on the caption. It's actually, the, the work of art was lost. And so now it's like a picture of the urinal called Fountain. Now, Fountain is the most famous of his so-called ready-made structures, ordinary manufactured objects designated by the artist as works of art. It epitomizes the assault on convention and accepted notions of art for which he became known. The original was now lost. Da, da, da. The urinal photograph is really quite a wonder. <laughs> Everyone who has... <laughs> I'm going to laugh. <sighs> Everyone who has seen it thinks it's beautiful. <laughs> so funny. And it's true. This is the funniest bit. It has an oriental look about it. A cross... <laughs> this is, I've got the giggles. I'm going to cry. Oh, sorry, I've got the giggles. A cross between a Buddha and a veiled woman. Now, put up the next slide. <laughs> it's a cross between those two, apparently. Okay? Now, you can actually see that. Now, um, it, it topped the poll of 500 British art experts as the single most influential artwork of the 20th century. It's now, this is where it actually... I, I, I find it funny, but it's also a really powerful point. Because it, it might be simple in form, but it's very rich in metaphor. The work has generated many interpretations over the years and continue to be seen as a work that challenges or at least complicates conventional definitions of art. Now, if you look into the story, and there's lots about it on the internet, he was actually making a very powerful point. There was a display, and they were told you can come and bring anything you want. Anything can be included in this display. So he brings this, and then he's told, oh, no, we didn't mean anything can be included, because yours can't. And it actually represents something massive. Now, um, the fountain... This is... a. Uh, Part of what I listened to today, the fountain forces the viewer to leave old questions of art behind. No longer are we concerned with questions of, is it good or bad? New questions arise. Now, I love this bit. What is art? That's an ontological question. How do we know, which is an epist... I can't even say the word. Epistemologically question. And an institutional question, who determines it? So if you put the next slide on for me, you've got this classic image of the Mona Lisa. You've got this fountain. And that one, everybody looks at and understands, you know, yes, that's art. We can see it. We know what that is. This guy comes along, and he basically asks some brilliant questions about what is art, how do we know and who decides what gets included? 
Now, the parallel, I'm not going to fill in all the blanks and the parallels for you, because I haven't got time, and I want you to come to some of those conclusions yourself, but I hope you can kind of see a parallel between the journey that church is on, where some expressions are coming into the church that makes other church think, churches think it's laughable, that makes us think that's ridiculous. But what if some of those questions are, what is church, how do we know, and who is determining what it is? Now, um, the, the one of the things you might have heard of is the canon. And the canon is like that accepted, you have the canon for literature and for theatre and for art. It's the thing that the powers that be have decided. Kids have to study Shakespeare. They have to study Shakespeare. You couldn't just study any old writer. It has to be the ones that are in the canon. There's a hierarchy and an, and a, an elitism about it and an exclusivity about it. Now, how do we marry this up? Now, what I want you to get symbolically is that... I don't know, it's, you're just going to have to try and <laughs> visualise this. What I want you to get symbolically, and I'm not being disrespectful, I promise, but this is kind of what, when Jesus showed up, this is kind of what he did to the religious art world. They had a precise way of seeing church, God, faith. He comes along and says, right, that's your version of kingdom Here's mine. And it was like sticking an urinal into the middle of the synagogue. It was because they were like, you can't do that. That's, it's unacceptable. It's distasteful. It's crude. It's, it's not right. It's unholy. You're taking the mick. That is what he was dealing with. And we're now in 2016, we have to be so careful that we don't end up with an acceptance art form that is conventionally accepted as church, that our job is to sometimes put something else in the middle of the table that says, well, what about this? What about including this in the story? Now, I've lost my place. I always say that at some point during my preach, don't I? I've lost my place. Um, I get why they struggled at the time. I get why artists struggle. And I get why... Um, Church, I'm a church person. I get why we struggle to include some new things because it's very difficult to see that they could be in the same space or belong together. Because at face value, it seems to insult the skill, effort, worth, energy, and the quality of the greater artists. Um, to appear, I mean, it doesn't seem like this guy has had to work anywhere near as hard as that guy, does it? But shaking the status quo and being willing to stick your neck out and do something different for the sake of future generations who are going to follow is actually not an easy thing to do. Now, the picture on the left might be aesthetically more pleasing, but if we can't embrace the symbolism on the right, we're going to actually um, diminish the world of art and there might be things that we find are aesthetically more pleasing and suit us, but if we can't embrace every expression that might be bought, then we're going to diminish what kingdom and our community can be. If I cannot make room in my faith for what I have viewed as having no value in my world... I'm going to exclude it. And we've been hearing about worldviews, haven't we? Now, I want to talk about the um, issue of quality because I think it's one of the most burning issues. Who thinks the Mona Lisa is a quality work of art? <laughs> Not many of you, actually. <laughs> um, who looks at that and thinks that's a quality piece of art? Okay, so we all have an opinion. How do you tell if something is good and who tells you that's good? Um, and one of the things that I read about is the criteria by which um, art is judged. I mean, it's so complicated, but it goes through, a, 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 there's a whole process of what makes good art. Um, and it says here, there's no easy answer because many of the methods of, ju of judging are very problematic. And many of the criteria used to assess art 
are conflicting. I think there's parallels in church life as well, isn't there? We have financial value, popularity, historical significance, and aesthetic sophistication, and all of these things could be at odds with each other. Now, one line of argument says that you cannot judge art on its aesthetic beauty at all, that you cannot judge uh, anything from the outside. Now, Proust said something, is it Proust? I'm so rubbish with these names. Proust said something to the effect of this, we only see beauty when we're looking through an ornate gold frame, because beauty is very much about familiarity and reinforcing an idea that we already have. We will find the things beautiful in life that we are familiar with and already um, know, and, know and like. It's like when you go on holiday, all you really want to do is take the photograph you've seen in the brochure. Our idea of beauty is constructed by family, friends, education, nationality, race, politics, all of these things. And this person goes on to explain at great length that although there's lots of debate and he talks about all the different ways it's debated, he sums it up in this. If enough of the right people think it's good, that's all there is to it. And I have a bit of a, I don't want things to be decided on the majority of what everybody else has decided is good because what if we've all got a wonky measure? What if what, if what we've come to as a version of beauty um, isn't actually all there is to be seen and experienced? Now, there are behaviours and attitudes that I find beautiful and others that I find very ugly. But these are not the same as yours. I can look at how someone behaves and I think that's beautiful. Someone else can look at how that person behaves and think that's really ugly. Because what we see and find appealing is based on, uh, really, what's been built up within ourselves. And we're back to worldview again. Now, even when there is much agreement, we cannot decide based on the majority viewpoint. Now, if you, um, a couple of Wednesdays ago, Anth talked about the legacy, shaping our future and the legacy of our past. Is that the right title I wrote? The leg no, wrong, wrong. The legacy of our past and the shape of things to come. If you weren't here and haven't listened to it, please, please do, because actually I think it's a very significant message for us moving forward, because he talked about empirical, um, corporate and organic models of church. And it's so important that you listen to the wisdom behind that and the examples of that because it was very powerful. Um, and in a corporate brand culture, in a corporate world, and a number of us work in a corporate world, you have to keep people um, you have to keep people happy. And that's how corporate, corporate stuff works. And so if you're in a, in a world like with the sort of art world where you've got some stakeholders who are funding galleries and fund it, putting all the money behind it, they're going to ultimately decide what goes in and what goes out because you've got to keep them happy because otherwise you don't have a gallery at all. And one of the things that um, Anth was very grateful for here is that actually we've been able to follow the revelation that we believe is right without having to sort of... I don't know what I'm saying. But there's an organic leading that we're going with. We're not trying to create this brand. We're trying to actually follow the spirit, and that's really important. Now, he talked about the implications of all this, and one of the things he said was that we're not building a manicured plot, that we're building a forest garden. And as I listened, you know, you think, well, you could have, a, you could have something that, that looks so aesthetically beautiful, because we've sorted it, and we've got the lines and the precision, and it looks just like, ah. Oh. But that's not what we're actually called to build. We're called to include something that asks the questions. What is church? How do we define it? Who's determining what it is? What is it supposed to look like? We're actually called to do something quite different. Now, part of what changed the art world was photography. Because portraits, the only way you could see what someone looked like used to be because you had to paint them. But when a camera came along, you could just take a picture. So then these people that had made their living off doing lifelike drawings were like, oh, <laughs> don't need me anymore. It's going to take a second to take a picture. And so one of the things that people started doing was experimenting with different ways of viewing beyond realism. Because realism could now be captured 
artists were able to think, right, I don't need to capture realism anymore, although you may choose to. Let's look at other things we can explore, because this is now already covered. And I was thinking about um, the legacy of church over centuries and Christianity and, um, and all that stuff that we talk about. And some stuff's already been captured. It doesn't need to be repeated again year after year after year. We've done that bit. We've had that bit. There's ways of doing that bit. Um, there's room to paint in other ways. There's room for it to expand. Um, there's room for us to look at the other nuances around it. Not because that didn't have its place and its time, but because actually that bit's been captured now. What's next? Where are we going next? What does it look like? Um, I read this as well, the um, and talking about the church. The tradition then is painting, not making copies of the same painting over and over. The challenge of the art is to take what was great about previous paintings and incorporate that into new ones. It's about a forward momentum. Now, the tradition then, for me, is revolution. So we're not about a brand of always being in a certain way of it's going to look like this. It's going to always look like this. If anything tries to not look like this, we're going to shut it down and we're going to keep it looking like this because this is our brand of faith and life. It's actually about a revolution. Now, my first response to the word revolution was it's a bit of a negative battle rising up. Um, and there might be elements of that, but the revolution is also to do with the, the circle, but it's like the cycle. If you've got a revolution in the air, you're not going anywhere. If you've got a circle on the ground, like a bike wheel, and that starts revolving, you actually get some forward direction. And so it's about it being grounded and rooted and making contact in your life. So actually, there's, a, there's an opportunity so for us to get grounded in some stuff and connect with some stuff, that's going to move us forward in brilliant, brilliant ways. Now, what if the, my construct is based on um, a, a brand of what things are worth that was passed down to me, not out of a sense of revelation? What if we only think that that's better than that? Well, we do. We only think that's better than that because something in our life has told us that that's better than that. Something was handed down to us. If that had been introduced first and someone did that, you might think the other way round, actually. And we only can't comprehend that because it wasn't introduced to us in that order. And so much of what has been introduced to us is, becomes our fixed point because it came first. But what if the first thing that we encountered is not actually the full encounter. Are we just going to stay there or are we going to embrace something new? Now, what determines the worth in your life? Is it that your life looks pleasing or feels pleasing? Is the worth just about that external stuff or is there another worth going on deep down? Now, Adam and Eve in the garden were asked a great question. They were asked, who told you that you were naked? I love that who told you. We are told things all the time. And sometimes we just believe what we have been told and has been passed down to us. And who, who told us? Who told us it was true? Um, I really am quite lost. Okay. In Acts 10, there's a guy called Peter. Some of you will have heard of him. Lots of you will have heard of him. And he goes through a moment where um, he comes to an understanding that what hasn't been included before can now be included. And it was, again, controversial. It was, can the message go to the Gentiles as well as the Jews? Which, again, isn't something we consider now. But we are a result of Peter being willing to embrace something that was a brand new thought. We are a result of that thought. Because for him, these people were not in the picture. They weren't going to be in the gallery. It wasn't going to be a gallery with this in as well. But he made room. Um, some of what we use to see is actually not seeing at all. Let me explain. Um, you know how when you get a revelation, you know, it's like your light comes on. You suddenly get something you didn't get before. They're my favorite moments because I don't like being confused. Um, my husband will tell you I ask a lot of questions. 
Um, because if I don't get it, I have to understand. So I just will be like this relentless woman going, but what about this, what about this, what about this? And then when the light comes on and I get it, it's like, oh, phew, amazing. But actually, we have in our world, and, and Chris has talked about this before, we have a lot of artificial light. Think of how many lights are on in your house late at night where a few years ago, well, quite a lot of years ago now, the lights would go down, you'd have your candle, nothing else to do, you might as well go to bed. And then you'd break up with the sun. We have so much artificial light. We have our tablets and we have our phones and we have our lights and our night lights. And I mean, when you look, when I go and stay with my sister and she lives in the Pyrenees Mountains in France, the sky is just incredible. And whenever I'm there and see that mountain sky, I realize how awful our sky is because it's just polluted, isn't it, with all that, that light. Now, um, there is a way, we have found ways in life to make sure it never goes dark. And Anth was talking about this as well a little bit last week. Um, but it's part of the design of creation that sometimes things go dark so that you can then see. Your body needs it. The, the earth needs the darkness. The ecosystem needs the darkness. And yet we constantly try and make things light. And I think where we do that, this to me also symbolizes where we do that. We look at the one on the left and we get it. We look at the one on the right and we don't. So let's just stay with the one on the left. It might, it might not fully answer all of our questions, but at least we don't have to deal with that bit. And what we would do is we would rather keep an artificial construct that we were handed down than be in the dark, having to think, oh my goodness me, you know, I don't get this yet. But if we don't go to the place where we don't get it, the true light doesn't really come on. Um, the difference, you know, between a flower and a weed is a judgment, isn't it? Someone's decided that, you know, this just takes over my garden. I don't like it. But when was that decided, that poor little plant? When was it decided that that was one that was unacceptable? Now, each of us have an intrinsic value in life. Whether you feel and look like that or you feel and look like that, you have your part to play in the gallery. You, you get, you're included. You are included, and both, to me, have a phenomenal value. Phenomenal, because there's something to be said for that, and there's a heck of a lot to be said for someone willing to ask those questions. Um, now, a revelation of that grace on a person's life. I'm jumping about a bit. Am I jumping about a bit? Are you following me? Okay. Um, if we all have this intrinsic value and worth, so we look at that and we agree, both are worth something. They are different, but they both have worth. Um, we've got to then genuinely go there. If what we think is, that's worth worthy, that one isn't, but it's all right. I'll give it grace. If we have to have it, we have to have it. That's not us seeing it as worthy. And it occurred to me, and I wrote it down, a revelation of grace is not that you see a person or a thing as unworthy, but choose to be kind anyway. That's just artificial light. A revelation of grace is that you genuinely get a revelation that that person is intrinsically worthy. That's a different thing. They may not be the work of art that you prefer or express it in a way that remotely works for you, but they get to be included in the gallery to be part of the story as much as you do. Yay! That's good news. Um, someone, um, someone reminded me of the story of the Emperor's New Clothes a couple of weeks ago. And I Every day, something has reminded me of this story. Every single day. And The Emperor's New Clothes is the story. If you don't know it, you'll have to go and look it up. But basically, um, I won't tell the story. I've not got time. But The Emperor's New Clothes, lots of you will have heard of it. Um, the, the point behind the story is that it represents a collective ignorance of an obvious fact of deception despite undeniable evidence. Um, now... Am I asking you to be ignorant, to ignore the undeniable evidence of how we can be? Because you might say to me, Jenny, if you're asking me to say that that is as good as that, we're all just lying. You're asking me to be ignorant because that is not the same as that. 
that doesn't have the same worth as that. Um, no, I'm asking you to see what, for me, this week, the Emperor's new clothes really are, that we will dress ourselves up in our own viewpoints and we will act like we're the final authority on any matter, that we will define our own and others' worth based on our viewpoint. We'll dress ourselves up in that and say, yes, I've got this all sorted, I'm somebody now. Um, which, for those of you who know that Adam and Eve story, defining yourself is a really dangerous trajectory to send yourself off on. I'm nearly done. Now, I am not an authority on art. I'm not, you can tell. But I can see that both of these have great value for different reasons, and I can see that both have had influence and impact in many, many ways. Um, now, in a community like this, there will be people who have incredible talent and skill, and you'll just think, oh, wow. Um, and then there might be other people. So you, might, you might be someone who questions your inclusion and questions your part to play. And, and the challenge is this, that we are all in the gallery. We are in the Kingdom Gallery, we are in this community, and we all have incredible value. Um, and also, in my view, we all have, well, it's not my view, it's fact. We all have influence. And therefore, because we have influence on the people nearest and dearest to us, we also have responsibility for the community. Um, and so my challenge to you tonight is that we've got to make room for more than we've ever made room for before, individually and as a community. We have to make room for some moments like this, where something is brought to the table that's a question that questions the very essence of what we're doing and who we are. And we have to be willing to have those, have those questions and not be afraid. Um, because there's room for new works of art beyond what we've ever known before. There is room, because this kingdom is bigger than we've ever experienced before. And for some of you, there's a real need um, for you to accept a worthiness on your life. Um, I I'm not trying to be crude, but some of you feel like a urinal sometimes. You feel just so worthless. But there is phenomenal value on your life because there is intrinsic value on your life. And who told you that there's not a place for you? Who told you? Let's work from a place of acceptance. And from there, when we accept that everything's in, we can become the most joyful, generous-hearted community to stir each other up, to keep up that revolution, because we don't, Jesus is not a brand that we need to protect. He's big enough to look after himself, right? He's not a brand that we need to protect. We don't have to be like, we must uphold this. There is room. There is room. And I have to say, I, based on what I have read and understood and had revelation of, I think he's more likely to get excited about expressions like that and what it does to our moving forward than he worries that we're, we're going to leave some stuff behind. We are expanding, we are growing. Um, make room, make room, make room in your life for more than you've ever known. And let's see each other as intrinsically worthy and see yourself as intrinsically worthy. Because the truth is, we only think we're not because of something that we were handed down. And let's listen to the voice. What's that song? Hear the voice of, louder than the voice that whispers you're unworthy. Hear the sound of love that tells a different story. Okay. I'm done. Shall we? Okay. Yeah. Let's do that then. This song, uh, You Can Come As You Are on the set tonight, but we were running out of time, so we decided to miss it out, so it was, was there. But it is true, louder than the voice that whispers you're unworthy, hear the voice of love, hear the sound of love that tells a different story. Why won't we listen? Just, it, it beats me. We always want to define ourselves rather than letting the one who loves us more than anything, define us and tell us our worth. And it would be just wonderful if for one minute we'd stop trying to figure it out. Remember, if you're going to define your worth, you've got to take the, the good, the bad, you've got, to, you've got to be able to weigh it all up. It's, it's actually very hard work. Think about it. But if we actually allow ourselves to be defined 
by the goodness and the, the righteousness and the awesome, just wonderfulness of someone else, and we just have to accept it. How easy can that be? And yet somehow we don't want it, do we? We want to we wanna do it ourselves. So I thank Jenny. Thank you for that. Um, I think we'll put the toilet on a picture somewhere, the urinal on a picture. We've got to have it somewhere now, haven't we, that? You know, next to the Mona Lisa. So anyway, let's just sing from Louder Than The Voice. Can we just do that verse uh, to, to the end? Is that okay? Louder than the voice. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others. <laughs>